welcome to today's Community Cast. My name is Matt Morgan. I'm the pastor at Community Brookside, a new church plant in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so blessed by your presence, and we hope that today's content will bring you joy. In April 1998, there was an issue of the devotional magazine called Our Daily Bread, where editor Henry G. Bosch tells a story that illustrates the importance of having Christian integrity Because I don't know if you know this or not, but we often live in a world where Christian integrity is not the norm, right? So here's what he says. The story he says is this. As a schoolboy, I worked with my father during the summer months. Each morning, we stopped to pick up an early edition of the newspaper at a small grocery store. One morning when we got to work, my father found that by mistake, he had taken two newspapers instead of one. He first thought of paying the man the extra price the next morning, but then after a moment's consideration, he said... I had better go back with this paper. I don't want the man at the store to think that I'm dishonest. He got in his car, drove back to the store, and returned the paper. About a week later, someone stole money from the grocery store. When police pinpointed the time it occurred, the grocer remembered that only two people being in the store at that time, and one was my father. The grocer immediately dismissed my father as a suspect, saying, that man is really honest. He came all the way back here just to return a newspaper that he took by mistake. The police then focused their investigation on the other man who soon made a full confession. My father's honesty made a big impression on that non-Christian store owner and on me. So while this is just an anecdote, a simple story, it's a great example of the benefit of having Christian integrity. Can you define what Christian integrity is? Do you know what it is? If I read you the definition, would you be like, oh yeah, I knew that. Yeah, okay, good. Because I'm going to read you the definition and hopefully you will recognize that as truth. Christian integrity means staying true to the teachings of Christ and living your life according to the principles of morality and ethics. Integrity is not just about being honest in your words and actions, but also fulfilling responsibilities that you have been entrusted with. It involves wholeness of character, an uncompromising adherence to a code of values, and consistency of word and deed based squarely on the word of God. Simply put, Christian integrity involves living a way that reflects the teachings and the example of who Jesus was, demonstrating honesty, sincerity, integrity, authenticity in one's words and actions and the way that we interact with other people. Integrity also includes maintaining a commitment to personal growth and transformation, seeking to continually align one's life with the moral and ethical teachings of Jesus Christ. So what I hope you heard there at the very end is that integrity is a process. We don't just get Christian integrity. We have to maintain Christian integrity by knowing who Jesus is, and by constantly seeking to do what Jesus did, right? So Jesus himself tells us uh, about what he expects of us in John chapter 14, 15 through 17. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screen. It says this, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. Christian character and integrity are essential aspects of a believer's spiritual journey, serving as a witness to others and contributing to the building of a just, loving, and compassionate society. And we can only have Christian integrity if we follow Jesus' commands and his example. So character and integrity require self-reflection, accountability, and a sincere desire to live out one's faith in a way that reflects who Jesus was. As Christians, we are supposed to live our lives with a type of integrity that reflects exactly what we believe about Jesus. Not just on Sunday mornings when we go to church, but every single day, no matter where we find ourselves, especially in Tulsa traffic. (laughs) Or when we're without power and we're hot. The way we live out our lives, either with integrity or without it, will either add to or take away from the credibility of the gospel. And I want you to hear that again. The way we live our lives, either will, with integrity or without it, will either add to or take away from the credibility of the gospel. And here's what I mean by that. When we act 
as people who truly are disciples of Jesus, meaning times when we are fair and honest and forthright and gracious to others, we embody who Jesus was, right? We are living out what Jesus said we are expected to do. We look like the authentic Jesus of the Gospels. People around us recognize Jesus at work in us. Our actions are in line with the actions of Christ. And the opposite is also true. When we say we believe in Jesus, but we act nothing like him, when we lie, cheat, steal, talk bad about people, use foul language, cut people off in traffic, get mad at Matt whenever he honks at you, set a bad example, the list goes on and on. When we do those things, we discredit the ministry that Jesus did here on earth. We, by our actions, take credibility away from the work of Christ in the Gospels. Church, we are called by God to live a life of integrity every single place we find ourselves. And that's really easy, isn't it? It's so easy. Psych, right? It is really hard for us sometimes to fully live with a life of integrity everywhere we are. We fail a lot at doing that, don't we? I see nobody nodding. Is it just me? Okay, I see a hand like, all right, good. It's just me. Oh, come on now. (laughs) Proverbs 10, 9 says this. You can follow along. It says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. Whoo. That is a promise. This scripture is both a promise and a warning, isn't it? When we as people who love God follow his path of integrity for our own lives, we can be sure that our paths will be secure. There is nothing for us to be afraid of because we can feel safe. We have nothing to hide. But when we sway from God's will for our lives and we act in a crooked manner, scripture tells us that we're not gonna be able to hide that for long. It is really apparent when we do something wrong because sin is always found out. I don't know if you guys have that same experience as I do, but anytime I have lied or cheated or done something that I shouldn't have done, it is always found out, friends. The path that is crooked will be found out. The scary part of our world today is that we now have this strange, weird scale to what is crooked and what is not. Here's what I mean. From our political leaders to local news anchors to teachers to pastors, people who would call themselves Christians act in ways unbecoming of those who take on the name Christian. It was just last October that a local man threw a Molotov cocktail through the local donut shop's door. This man who identified himself as a Christian by his hanging up of scriptures on the outside of the donut shop identified himself as a Christian, but yet still damaged somebody else's property by throwing a Molotov cocktail through the window because he disagreed with their after-hours drag performance that was happening there. So hear me when I say this. I know that we don't all agree on issues like that. There's a lot to talk about involving human sexuality and similar issues. And disagreement is absolutely okay. But I believe that our Christian integrity requires better of us when we disagree than throwing Molotov cocktails through people's windows. Do you think there might have been another way that this man could have expressed his anger? Maybe in a strongly worded letter, right? (coughs) Had there been times in your life when you've expressed your anger in a way that was unbecoming of a follower of Jesus? I think the universal answer there is yes. I think we've all been those people. The last thing that we should ever do is to try to hurt somebody because they have done something that we disagree with. Jesus would never do that. Neither neither must we. It just seems to me like it's really hard to find Jesus at work in the world around us today, isn't it? Because so many people who call themselves Christians don't look anything at all like the Jesus of the Gospels. People use the name of Jesus to abuse others, to hold others down. And that's not what the gospel of Jesus Christ was about. Jesus was about liberating the oppressed, 
Jesus was about justice and righteousness. Jesus was about telling sinners that they are guilty and then loving them into a relationship with God. But so many Christians have gotten wrapped up in worldly values that they have neglected their Christ-centered, godly character. People are so invested in their quest for fame and success and power that they're no longer concerned with the things of God and are instead concerned with the things of the world. When our authority comes from talking heads on national television channels or political leaders rather than the scripture, we are moving in the wrong direction. When we look at what's trending to figure out what we think is right and good rather than what the gospel says is right and good, we are no longer in line with the Christian integrity that we are called to have. When any of us call ourselves Christians are living for the pursuit of personal happiness and self-fulfillment and not for bringing about God's kingdom here and now for those who haven't experienced it, we are not living out the faith that Jesus has called us to. Our Christian integrity is lost when we live for ourselves and we do not follow the principles that were taught to us by Jesus himself. Our integrity becomes self-centered and watered down. And today I could easily make the argument that the Christian faith in America looks very dislike the savior of the world. The apostle Paul says in his letter to the church of Philippi, he tells us exactly how we should be acting as believers in Jesus. This comes from Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 8. Here's what the word of God says for us today. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above who? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Not looking to your what? But each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with, another, with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Jesus was willing to give everything he had so that other people could have something. And we just don't do that anymore. Here Paul tells us that Jesus put other people first. How often do you hear people or see people who call themselves Christians treating others in a selfish way? It's like an everyday thing, isn't it? How often are we all conceited in the way that we look at the world? How hard is it to look after the interests of others if it conflicts with our own personal interests? Here Paul is reminding us that we have to, if we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we have to actually follow Jesus. We are expected to live our lives based on the example that Jesus set for us. Christ was humble and obedient. When was the last time you were humble and or obedient, right? Right? but we are expected to live with that same sense of humility and obedience. Yet two of the most important parts of Christian integrity that we are missing today are humility and obedience, putting other people first and obeying the will of God. We think everybody has to be like us. Everyone has to agree with us. Everyone has to act like us. Or we'll just throw a Molotov cocktails through your donut shop window. Jesus possessed many character traits that we too need to work on, that we too have to put into practice in our own lives if we want to be better followers of who Jesus is. And spoiler alert, none of them look like violence. Let's look at some of the ways that Jesus sets an example for us still today. Jesus lived a life full of love and compassion. John chapter 13, 34, and 35 says this, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is telling us we, our identity is revealed when we love people. And man, sometimes it's really hard to love people, right? People sometimes are almost unlovable. Sometimes people are intentionally unlovable, but that means we just got to love them all the more. Jesus doesn't tell us to only love people if we agree with them. 
He doesn't tell us to love people only if we are in the same denomination. He doesn't tell us to love one another with any sort of agenda. Jesus wants us to love everyone because he loved us first. He sets the precedent and we're expected to follow. Jesus also sought God's kingdom before anything else and especially sought to live a righteous life. One specific reason for his coming to earth was to show the world how much better it could be if we live into the will of God for us. If we bring about God's kingdom for those who don't experience God's righteousness at work in the world, we have to be agents of change for society all around us. And he worked every single day of his life to bring hope to people who were downtrodden and lost. He even went to the cross in order to prove his love of God's truth. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus asks us in the same way to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and then anything we need, all the things that we need, will be given to us as well. Jesus sought God's kingdom first, and though he was crucified, he received resurrection and the eternal reward, and we are promised the same thing, guys. Jesus also asks us to make disciples and to continually follow the lifestyle that he showed us to live while he was here. Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We've all heard that scripture before. But it's important to continually hear that. It's hard for us to make disciples of Jesus if we don't look like Jesus. We make disciples because Jesus made disciples first. Because Jesus made disciples and followed the lifestyle that God wanted him to follow, we are expected to do the same thing. We are asked by Jesus to live like him and teach others to also live like him. And he proves to us that it can be done. Right? One of the great things about Wesleyanism, right, or the Methodist church, is that we believe that there is such a thing as called Christian perfection, where everything we do is centered in the love of Jesus Christ. Every decision that we make, every interaction we have is centered so deeply in the love of Christ that we seek nothing but good for our neighbors. That is the ultimate example of what Christian love looks like and Christian perfection looks like. And according to John Wesley, we can attain that now if we just focus on who Jesus was. And we live in to the way that Jesus taught us. Jesus also forgave others and loved them right where he met them. And we were expected to do the same. <sighs> right? In Paul's letter to the church in Ephesians, or in Ephesus, he says in chapter 4, verse 32, for us to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Guys, I don't know about you, but it is hard for me to sometimes be kind and compassionate. Some days I'm really good at being compassionate, but I'm terrible at being kind. Some days I'm really good at forgiving people and loving them, and other days, man, I forget that I was also loved and forgiven of the mess that I've made of my own life. Even though it's hard, we are called to do it every single day. Our Christian integrity exists so that we can love and forgive others as a response to what Jesus did for us. He reconciled us to God. And lastly, Jesus asks us to point to him. John 14, 6, in that scripture, Jesus confesses that he is God's manifest truth when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Matt Morgan ain't getting you to heaven, right? Stacy Russian ain't getting you to heaven. Right? We have to point to Jesus and say he is the way. And it's really hard for us to point to Jesus and say, I've been saved, I've been healed, I've been reconciled to God when our life still looks like trash and we're not making any changes. Friends, our salvation is participatory, right? And I know that we have talked about verse, you know, uh, being saved by faith versus deeds. But in the book of James, we understand that faith without deeds is not true faith at all. 
Those things work together. We have to respond to the way that Jesus loved us by loving others in the same way. We have to pursue our salvation. We have to love Jesus. We have to follow Jesus. We have to point to him. Because Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, in order for us to be the people of Christian integrity, we must live our lives in a way that point to him. Not to us, clearly not to Stacey Rushing, not to a political party, not to a specific uh, affiliation or persuasion. We have to point all the way back to Jesus. I'm not picking on Stacy, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks ago, we talked about being people of unshakable faith. We talked about reading the word. We talked about showing up for church. And we talked about rediscovering a life of prayer that is reforming us. This week, in order for us to, to work towards rooting ourselves in a life of integrity, we're going to revisit those things, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth. So to add to our scripture reading that we talked about two weeks ago, we must not just read scripture just to know who Jesus is, but we must add studying God's word and applying it to our lives. Psalm 119, 9 through 16 says this, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that have come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. We cannot truly stay on a path of purity or live a life of integrity unless we are living according to God's word. And we have to know it. And the only way that we can know what God's word said is by reading it and by applying it, by thinking about it, by meditating on it, by researching it, by studying it deeply. And only then can we really understand from it and better apply God's word to our lives. Only then will we, will we be cultivating unshakable character. Only then will we truly live into our Christian integrity. And again, like two weeks ago, we talked about prayer, right? Right? redeveloping a prayer life that connects us to God through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this week, we're adding to that prayer life a dependence on the Holy Spirit for direction and guidance. Galatians 5, 16 through 25 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. I don't know what that means. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep step with the Spirit. Do you live by the Spirit? Like, do you really live by the Spirit? Too often we don't have the manifestations of the Holy Spirit in our lives because we spend much of our lives inviting sin in. And I don't mean that we sit around and we decide, hey, I'm going to sin today, but we fill our lives with things that are not holy. We fill our lives with social media accounts. We fill our lives with the, the words and the opinions of people who are not Christians, who are leaders who don't look anything at all like Jesus, and our lives are impacted by those things. If we're not living by the Spirit, we're not going to inherit what God promises us, that the Spirit gives us. I could use a little more self-control, friends. I could use a little more patience and forbearance. I don't even know what that means. But I know I need it in my life. And I'm not going to get it if I'm not focusing my life on the Spirit of God at work in the world around me and in me. 
If we are connected to God through our prayer life, then it will be much easier for us to discern what is right and wrong in our lives because we know God's desires for our lives. We are filled with the Spirit, and it's easier to follow God's way for us. We better know God's heart. And when we know God's heart, we will deserve to do, or sorry, we will desire to do the will of God. Prayer is important for us. Following the way of the Spirit is important for us. Next, to go a little bit deeper on two weeks ago conversation about surrounding ourselves with Christian community, I want us to focus ourselves with a community who are actually seeking to live holy lives. It is easy for us to surround ourselves with Christians but it's not so easy to fill our lives with people who are really following the will of Jesus. As I mentioned earlier on this morning, often people who call themselves Christians look vastly different from who Jesus was. These are not the people we should be surrounding ourselves with. We should intentionally spend time with people who like to exemplify a life that looks like Christ. We should be seeking to surround ourselves with people who are filled with Christian integrity so that we can learn from them and put into practice in our own lives some of the things that they do. We should intentionally spend time with people who look like Jesus. The hard part is, it's harder and harder to find people who really look like Jesus every day. Proverbs 13, 20 and 21 says this, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Troubles pursues the sinner, but the righteous are rewarded with good things. We can surround ourselves with Christians or we can surround ourselves with true followers of Jesus. And we have to choose wisely because the world no longer accepts people who call themselves Christians who look nothing at all like Jesus. It's like putting on a disguise and people are beginning to see through it. We talk about church attendance. We talk about how churches are failing and struggling just to survive. It's because people who go to church don't look like Jesus anymore. And that has to end. We have to be the people that Christ has called us to be everywhere we are, not just in this building for an hour on a Sunday morning. And the last thing we have to do in order to cultivate an unshakable life of Christian integrity is to practice self-discipline and resisting the temptations of the world. And that, my friends, is hard. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27 says this, "Do Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games does not, or sorry, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Could you imagine sitting in church your whole life, your whole life from the time you're a child? Listen, I have tithed. I say my weekly prayer. I read scripture from the screen on Sunday mornings. I imagine it would be such a shock if you get to the pearly gates and Jesus goes, I'm sorry, you didn't really know me. And friends, I promise you, there are people who think they are Christians and aren't. And that's tough to swallow, isn't it? There are pastors who I believe preach an agenda that is not of Jesus. There are people around us every single day that look nothing like Jesus and think their eternal heaven is secured. We cannot be those people. I don't want to be disqualified for the race that I'm running. And I know you don't either. And so the only way to be prepared is to train for the race. And we've talked about it. Training is prayer. It's reading scripture. It's filling your lives with people who are full of Christian integrity. We are training for a race that is important and is life-changing. We can't just act like we know what we're doing, where we're going. If we do that, we get lost. So as Nicole and I were dating before we got married, one of my favorite things to do was go on road trips. 
when we were younger, we'd go on road trips pretty regularly. And, and I don't know if you remember a time before GPS, but you always had to get like the atlases. And if you're driving from like Oklahoma to New York to visit my family, you have to get like the big full-size booklet and you have to like highlight out your route. You got to plan for it and prepare for it. Anybody remember those times? Yeah, right? I loved going on those road trips with Nicole because we got to sing together, we got to talk about our life together and kind of the plans for our future, but that woman could not read a map to save her life. <laughs> I love you so much, but sweetheart, do what? We did, after I pulled over many a time and had to look at the map. If we do not prepare and decide our route in advance, we are going to get lost, aren't we? It's not just about planning a trip. It's also true in our Christian life. We must have an idea of what the journey of following Jesus is going to look like, and we have to prepare for that journey. Otherwise, we will not successfully complete the race. So this morning, we're going to have to close out by addressing some common areas in our lives where we sometimes fail in our integrity. So let's talk today real quickly about honesty in our speech. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Friends, we can't be people who speak falseness. We can't be people who lie or tell partial truths. We also have to be people who live out our integrity by remaining faithful to our commitments and our relationships. Proverbs 3, 3 through 4 says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. People will see the way that we value them and our commitments to serve others, and that is important. We also have to show our integrity in our work and our professional lives as well, and sometimes that's really hard, right? Because there are people at work that just, man, they push our buttons, right? Right? Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And that is hard to remember. But in everything we do, we have to act like we're pleasing our Lord Jesus. And when we do that, it will show other people how we really do love Jesus. Lastly, we have to maintain a moral purity and act ethically in everything we do. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. We cannot follow the holy life of Jesus without seeking to be holy as well. This is why Christianity has suffered so much in the last hundred years or so. We have stopped desiring a holiness for our lives. Here in the book of 1 Peter, it is abundantly clear that we have to be holy just like Jesus was holy. And when we seek to become holy, even if we shall fall short, we will be better off than we were if we weren't aiming for holiness, right? So church, this week and always, may each of us seek to become holy like Jesus. May our lives reflect the very nature of Jesus in the way that we live and love our neighbors. May our desires for the justice of Jesus drive us towards action on behalf of those who can't seek justice on their own. May the love of Jesus be found within each of us as we seek to bring about God's kingdom here and now. And through each of these things, may we set for the world an example of the true power that a faithful believer in Jesus makes on the world around us. May our unshakable Christian integrity and character once again draw the world to a Jesus that loves them and forgives them and desires new and better life for them. Thank you so much for joining us on today's Community Cast. We hope that you were blessed by today's conversation. If you'd like to know more about Community Brookside, please feel free to visit us at our website, communitybrookside.com, or find us on your favorite social media outlet. We hope to hear from you soon. Be blessed.